All right. All right. Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to the fifth reoccurring public meeting for the Gap Fact Industry Partnership Subcommittee. I'm Stephanie Hardison. I'm the Deputy Designated Federal Officer, along with the Designated Federal Officer, Boris uh, Aratia. Boris, I'll turn it over to you for a few words. No, just uh, thanks, everybody, for jumping in again. And uh, we're definitely making some progress here. So I'm looking forward to uh, continuing the good discussions that we have started. So um, back to you, Stephanie. As always, before we get started, we just have a few things that we'd like to mention. This is a live virtual public meeting. Today's event is being recorded and will be posted to our website with all relevant meeting material. Um, there will be time for any relevant comments or statements towards the end uh, for the public, and we welcome those. Um, we will now open the meeting uh, of Industry Partnership Subcommittee by taking roll. All right. Farad. Gotcha. Denise? Present. All right. Gail? Present. Um, Nicole? Susan? Present. All right. Uh, Daryl? Kristen? I see you. Yeah. Uh, Stacy? Nigel? Present. Um, Keith, David, and Kimberly. Is it? Got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mamie present. Oh, yes. Mamie, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I apologize. And Mamie, absolutely. My apologies. Um, at this time, I'll now turn it over to the chairpersons. Kristen, for us. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate that. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, Eagles fans and the rest of everybody else. Uh, so uh, we got a nice agenda today. Uh, before I go through the agenda real quick, I'll just turn it over to Farad. Farad, any opening comments? No, just thank you so much for being here for this work. Uh, we continue to go forward and the participation is always healthy and conversation is always robust. So we ask that people tune in into the work that we're doing and thank you so much. Kristen. Great, thanks. So uh, we kind of have a reverse agenda today. We're going to uh, do some business. Uh, then we've got some great speakers. So uh, for business for the subcommittee, we're going to go back through our speakers list. Uh, we have a few speakers lined up. Uh, so we want to kind of go through that and talk about a few things. If we have time, we'll go to the uh, subcommittees and the priorities. Uh, then we'll switch over to public comment. Um, and then our speakers from EPA, uh, Ms. Holly Elwood and Stephen Sylvan will be coming on at four and they will be giving an updated version of a presentation that they gave to the acquisition workforce subcommittee. And it was uh, chock full of some interesting content uh, that I think we'll find useful uh, for our subcommittee work. Uh, and then we'll, we'll close out for the day. So with that, uh, Boris, I don't know if you're able to um, go ahead. Why don't we go right into the speaker uh, list? If you could, oh, thank you. You're so you're much faster than I am. So just uh, what I was trying to do is get this a little organized for us. So up at top is who we have already had speak or who we have scheduled to speak. So today, as mentioned, we've got uh, two speakers from EPA. Next week at our admin meeting, uh, Katie Miller from FAST is gonna come back and speak with us. If you recall, um, she gave a presentation earlier on in our efforts. And then Boris, if you can help me out, uh, I believe we have Antonio Doss. Is he, if he's coming on the 15th public or is he coming to the next admin? I couldn't yeah. remember. Yeah, that's the public meeting. So Antonio Doss, who is a fellow member of the, uh, the Gap Back and he's on the uh, policy and practice subcommittee. Great, great. So actually, if you go ahead and scroll down, we'll go right into him before we get into some others. So we, Bar, Boris Farad and I had a chance to have a preliminary call with Antonio. So we had kind of talked through some questions uh, to kind of frame that for him. And I, I committed to him to getting that uh, back to him. He works in the Small Business Administration, and he was in the, I believe, the Office of Business Development and is now taken on a new position 
uh, more focusing on the field uh, offices and their engagement and outreach. Uh, I probably butchered that a little bit, Boris. So um, any clarification there? No, I think you're you're good. Uh, the, he's working with the field operations part of SBA, where he's working with different regions, um, basically the the entities that help the local small business initiatives for each of the communities. So he's it's a bigger scope than what he had before. Yeah, and uh, he, yeah. he really uh, the preliminary call I thought was really good. So what I wanted to do was just spend a few minutes here and talk a little bit about. Um, you know, have we captured some of the essence of what we would want him to speak to us about? So I can actually take some notes here. Uh, we've got, so from his experience, you know, what has worked well with engaging uh, with this business community? Um, from his experience, what are some of the barriers? So it'd be nice to know that uh, as we try and form recommendations. Uh, he does have some ideas, I believe, for who else we might want to speak with. Um, talk a little bit about the business development office. Um, any recommendations for us? I'll clean up this typing. So while we take a few minutes, um, I think what's really important is that we have some questions in advance for all our speakers. So just let's take a little committee time here and think about, are there any other questions um, we would want to position uh, for Antonio for his discussion. You yeah, guys... and, and Kristen, I, I would add something else Antonio mentioned is he was going to try to line up a colleague uh, from SBA also who's working on, on business development initiatives, uh, particularly like different programs like an 8A program, which is a popular program within SBA, but there's other programs in trying to promote uh, growth. Within, so he may be also bringing one of his colleagues along. Okay, so you think he, they may he may bring that colleague with him to the session? Right. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. I know we um, talked a little bit about that. That was pretty interesting, but good. Thanks, Boris. Yeah, that was going to be my comment. Questions about what you know, what types of programs or vehicles they have that are sized for smaller businesses. Good, thanks, Denise. Yeah, we know that uh, SBA really has like three functions that I've seen them do in their work. It'd be interesting if he can speak to those in the fa fashion of the credit um, opportunities they have for small business, um, the contracting opportunities, how they help to make those a robust. And then next is how they really work hard in their consulting services and their the things that they do in consulting with their women's business centers and the SBTV, T, or TBCs and whatever else they have, it'd be really good for us to have that information and categorize it as capital contracts and consulting um, to learn about those things. Um, if you can speak to those, I think they'd be helpful for the population that we're looking for to work with. Did I capture that correct, Farad? I'm not sure I did. Yes, capital consulting and contract opportunities. I think you see the capital will be some of their um, products that they have. The consulting would be some of the things they fund, the centers they fund around the country, and maybe how we can align ourselves with those, with the women's business centers and the SBTV, SBTCs, BCs, DCs, as well as um, contracting opportunities. And a lot of that's around the SBA, 8A, stuff like that. Just I'm just trying to categorize it in a way that we can inform the community in a very clear, concise way. Um, so the triple C's just make it <laughs> make it easier, you know, capital contracting and, and consulting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nigel, for helping me out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's D you're not a DC guy. You got to get used to the acronym. <laughs> you have an acronym for everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they have the SBDCs, but they have also the SBTDCs. Yes. The technical. The technical, yeah, so right. yeah, right. technical development. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I had even gotten to PCRs and all that kind of no, stuff. No, 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 no. Let's keep it simple, man. <laughs> We're early. Me. We're early in the <laughs> afternoon, right. gentlemen. Right. <laughs> okay, great. Well, maybe another area is since we're focused on integrating climate and sustainability to understand if they have any climate or sustainability directives.
also, I guess, you know, one of the areas we talked a lot about is on minority businesses. So if they have, you know, special tools or enhancements that they leverage for engagement with small with small businesses that also include like minorities, it would be good to understand that too, to see whether or not we need to be thoughtful about, you know, updating or, you know, whatever we might consider. And, and if I could add to that, there, I think what, what do they believe, what authorities do they believe they need or are lacking or what help could they get from either industry or government? What, what, what additional resources do they think they need in order to help deliver on this larger sustainability uh, requirements that are, being, that are coming down? Like what, what, what help can we provide them? And then also, it, it, do they have insights into? I've been having some conversations about that uh, the the China um, the China tariff that's coming, and a lot of companies that are in this environmental sustainability space that manufacture these goods trying to move to the United States um, as quickly as possible in order to avoid that thirty percent tariff that's going to be hitting them. What is the potential of bringing this community that we're trying to bring to the table? because these guys are going to be manufacturing here in the United States, right? How do we bring that potential? Because I know we've got International Trade Administration, we've got folks at Department of Commerce, MBDA does some international. What are the strengths in government right now? What are the tools in government right now that can help bridge those gaps between those manufacturing entities that are coming and the U.S. businesses that would be implementing them so we can build that supply chain that robust supply chain okay and nigel i'd be so really wait 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 Mia, can we get i want to make sure i capture that because i had to stop typing nigel just to listen so so i how do i say this how do we how do we leverage the full capacity of the federal government and the agencies that encourage international trade or bringing foreign investment into the United States through manufacturing or what like the foreign companies are coming to the United States because they see the potential of growing this green economy. They want to profit off of it. How do we then bring those capabilities to the table through all of these various tools that we have at the Department of Commerce, at the State Department, at whatever, what already exists that we can leverage or enhance in order to help promote the growth of this supply chain ecosystem around sustainability and climate change. So Chris, you don't have to type what I'm saying to Nigel. I just, Nigel, I'm, I'm also, want to say that if he doesn't have these information who we should focus on in case this is, falls outside of his bailiwick i'm just thinking out loud i don't know how much climate stuff is being yeah. in um introduced to sba for an outcomes but it would be interesting to know like um i thought kimberly had a good point if there are things what are they but if they're not that's also something we may want to make sure that we start talking about I, that's a gap analysis, right? Let's figure out where the gaps are. Let's figure out what, what I love that. I think that's that'll help us grow as we're moving through this process. Gap analysis on uh, supplier, um, eligible suppliers to to the climate sustainability need. I, I... Oh, Nigel, where'd you go? He's on. He's talking to. Um, he's talking to a mute button, but he's doing it very well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Suppliers, tools, resources, and programs. So, if you don't have any of these, in order to try to achieve these goals, where can you point us that we could help find or get more information or bring new people to the table, new entities to the table to fill those gaps? Are you speaking specifically around companies that focus on climate and sustainability, green, green 
production or are you focusing on the entire federal supplier base? I would like that last question to be asked to every single one of our speakers. Because I think it brings a different perspective. If you're talking to somebody from industry and they say, what if you if you needed something from government, what program would be missing to help you? Is it market research, market analysis? Is it going through State Department, having them open open doors for you in foreign uh, foreign countries in order to bring resources to the United States? Look, what is it that's missing? Is it supply chain? Is it funding? It, what are the things that you view are missing that we need in order to build this ecosystem around climate change and sustainability? And the response is going to be different. Same question will probably get different responses depending on who's being asked. Oh, David, that's a deep question. That's a very deep. Yeah, Nigel, I'm going to have to ask you just to come back into this document when you have a minute and help me flush that out if you don't. Okay. Mind. Yeah. Yep. I, I will. I will. Happy to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Did you guys see David's question? Because that's that's a big. No, go ahead. Read it out if you don't mind. Well, I can just say it. Yeah, please. <laughs> so yeah, this this is a great conversation. It reminds me of a, a of a a certification program that I used to run, and we were and this is I'll get to the point in a second. But we wanted to remember to try out one of our new standards, and it took them a while to figure out this isn't something that we do in addition to everything else we normally do. This is what we will do instead of everything else we're going to do. So it didn't become kind of an extra thing. It kind of became part of what they do. And it took them a while to figure out the evolution of how they operate their facility from sort of meeting a standard. And I'm just wondering, I, I hear, where do we find suppliers? Maybe it's how do we make suppliers? Because it is an evolution, I think. For some, it might be simply upgrading their equipment. They have old equipment, it's inefficient, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Get new equipment, it should be leaner in that direction. So I'm just... Some, we're, we're kind of somewhere in that. I just don't know sort of how we can help sort of the evolutionary process along. At least that's how I'm thinking about it. Hey, David, the reason why I think that's an important question that we kind of reflect upon is because if they have um, consulting, consultants helping small businesses, is this a part of their, you know, their, their, their check sheet, right? The, the, the checklist of things. Are they talking to their uh, the women's business centers or the SBT, SBDCs, SBTDCs, all, all of those company things that are affiliated with SBA talking around sustainability. And if they're talking about credit facilities, are they asking questions around sustainability? I just that's why I'm I'm curious to see if sustainability has been introduced and indoctrinated into the culture of SBA or are they reacting to it? Because that's great. You know, that's important. That's great. I want to make sure we get that. I'm writing some notes. I've, I've totally given up on typing. Um, I like that because I think we heard from a different speaker in the acquisition workforce subcommittee about contracting and how there's current requirements and those requirements don't, at a very high rate, don't even make it into the RFI, RFPs that go out. So we we kind of think we're like everybody's on the same page. So um, I like that question a lot, Farad. So uh, what I'm going to do is once we we'll curate these questions for Antonio, and I'll send the link out. We can kind of get one more look at them, uh, so we can refine that. But where exactly are they with embedding these climate and sustainability factors, training, all that into their programs. Did I capture that, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think, okay, yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. And I, I further hope that if they've already embedded them, they're not in the standard clause section that everyone's missing them. <laughs> yeah, where and how. Yeah, you know, where and how, if they if they have implemented them, you know, have they just uh, attached them to the 60 pages of clauses that come anyway, <laughs> so that people might know their new requirements. And if they have, what are they, what type of feedback are they getting? Right. You know, through their channels. If they haven't, to a high extent, they're not, you know, we won't have any feedback are they getting? Okay, good. 
Yeah, I know one of the things that we're that we experienced as a small business in the federal government space was the um, rapid increase of uh, requirements after a long quiet period. So we got the uh, telecommunications China ban, while we got the you know additional uh, Buy America information. As so, so there's a there are a lot of new federal requirements coming at federal contractors at all levels. Um, so sometimes it's starting to become it started to become very noisy in that and, and with the small business trying to figure out does it apply? Do I comply? Very difficult. So this could fall in that same realm. Denise, is that something that we could recommend to SBA to have a specific targeted educational program about Definitely. language and right that's something we could say this is a challenge that small businesses have always faced when you guys layer on all these yeah. complexities we need you to focus on a specific program around clarification and education and even hand-holding through some of these processes and procedures in order to make sure that the companies that want to play in the space are compliant, are resilient, are doing what they need to yeah. do. Yeah, and aren't scared off because they can't even figure out if it applies or if I can. If we, I left us not still knowing if we complied with the telecommunications China ban. We called it the "Don't do business with China with telecommunications." You know, it's just very they're written in a very confusing way, even for firms that are astute in these myriad of clauses. It was head scratching. <laughs> and if they do it in a central function, central kind of way from SBA mothership, prop, SBA right. proper, could they then distribute those trainings, that education, that support through their national network partnerships with Women's Business Center, Small Business Development Center, SCORE, and give them the materials they need so it's reaching the people on the ground? Yeah, I, I do think so, because the previous federal administration, you know, had a was a very in the regulatory sense, you had to, to make a new regulation, you had to kill two. Um, so <laughs> we small businesses on that side of the fence experienced a long period of no new real requirements or regulations. And now um, that has seen an, an increase with a lot of the, you know, the new funding bills, which is great, more money, but also more strings. <laughs> hey, hey, Nilo, just a word of clarification. So the recommendations would go to GSA. And from, from this federal advisory committee, however, in, in, in couching those conversations and the recommendations, you can certainly reference the role of SBA, but you're making the recommendations to GSA. Okay. Obviously, GSA works with SBA, but just, just making that point of clarification. Got it. I, got it. I, I just want to make sure I'm not reinventing the wheel and trying to create a whole new thing. Like we have people who do this type of thing already. Yeah, I understood. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting, do we really have a good sense of how strong all those channels are, you know, and then relative to climate and sustainability? Um, and I, you know, I, based on all the speakers I've heard so far, like I'm learning, like it's less, it's, the beacon has been kind of lit up, but it's not really permeated out into these channels as, as fully as probably people think. Um, so. Excellent. Okay, if we could go down, could we scroll down for us? Did we lose the screen? Thanks. Yep, I'm in back here. All Thank right. you. Yep. So um, we'll refine those and get them back out to everybody. Um, the next couple of speakers we had here, um, uh, I've got to reach out to. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit more. So uh, I think it was Nicole who had offered up the um, Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for an Inclusive Economy. Um, I haven't reached out yet. I, I believe that was Nicole's, but I can certainly do that. Um, somebody had mentioned the, oh, could you scroll up? Sorry, the, uh, one more. The American Sustainable Business Network. And I don't know, um, I don't know who had that or if anybody has a contact there or how we would want to go about if we think we would like them to come in and speak with us. 
I can check with our sustainability team to see if they have a contact. Okay, great. That would be awesome. Was that was that your entry? I can't remember. I don't think it was me, but I'm happy to, like I said, I'm happy to follow up. We may we may have a contact. Okay, great. Great. I'm just going to put, uh, Kimberly, I'm just going to put you in there for now. I'll clean it up later. Thank you. Um, you know, I went back and uh, looked at the American Council for Technology, which uh, GSA is pretty actively engaged in that. There's um, they have, they actually have two groups. They have a small business working group and they have a climate sustainability working group. Um, and they have some conferences and things like that. So A, would we like to hear from them on what they're doing in those two efforts, kind of pose up questions uh, similar to what we're doing for Antonio. Uh, and if so, I can certainly uh, take that and see if I can't. Uh, get that lead going, but I wanted to kind of hear from the the subcommittee on this. This would be more of probably what are some of the bigs doing to assist the small and what are we doing to drive climate and sustainability into procurement uh, and into programs. Yay, nay, what do you guys think? Is it... So for uh, just the question for act IAC? No, do we want to hear from them? I, I'm a big fan. I think they are uniquely positioned. I've worked with them quite a bit when I was at Accenture, when I was at Info. Uh, I am a big fan of act IAC. I think they have uh, a unique perspective around the procurement. I think I, we would like to shape the questions so it's very targeted um, around how to change the actual the acquisition policy around climate change and sustainability. Like how, how do we get to the nuts and bolts? Like if we're gonna make recommendations on how we change the contracting requirements or how an RFP is written, or we're giving scorecards or points towards climate change sustainability credits and things like that, how do we do that? Right. Okay. So I think that would be very educational for me. I, I, I think that would be helpful. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and reach out and then what we can do uh, as a subcommittee, just like we've done for Antonio, is we can curate kind of the content, uh, you know, what we're looking to learn from them and um, see if they can't um, attend one of our either. Now, Boris, would they be able to attend either an administrative or a public or does does that matter? I would, um, yeah, I would probably go for a public meeting okay. for this one. Yeah, for sure. All right, good, that helps with the schedule. All right, so I'll take the lead on that one. And then if we scroll down, uh, Boris and Nigel, I think you populated um, some lists of people that, uh, Farad, as you, not Boris, Farad, as you mentioned that we wanna keep in the loop uh, or keep getting feedback with, but it might also be good to hear from one or some of these groups. So I'd like to have some discussion around that. I think this this one in my perspective was when we got the request saying we don't know how to find the companies. And I've had to deal with this when I was a Senate staffer. Well, we can't find capable women-owned firms or minority firms to meet these requirements. And I was able to literally make some phone calls and come up with a stack of 15 and say, pick one, anyone. Um, these folks maintain uh, 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 databases of capable companies, right? So there's the one side of who's already in the industry, but going back to something David said earlier about, are we, is this about revolution or evolution? How do we create these firms? Hey guys, can you guys find people in your network, in your uh, uh, pan Asian American chamber of commerce or, uh, or 8A, national 8A associate, can you find companies that do dredging? Can you find companies that do rebar or whatever? And if so, would they be interested in getting whatever, whatever technical assistance to become more sustainable? How do we take these companies and bring them to the table? I don't know if these guys are going to be subject matter experts, helpful on climate change and sustainability, but they have networks of companies that we can bring into this 
growing industry. I and think I they really definitely... like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, no, Nigel, I really like that approach because it's a pivot and and it's leveraging what you already have, but not knowing what what you can do based on where industry is going. So I really like that approach. So but so uh, based on that, I think I do think it would be helpful to hear from one or some of them relative to our engage to expand kind of area of priority, um, priority focus in that, you know, and some of the questions might be, how can the government better leverage this network, your network? Um, how could we improve engagement with you to <clears throat> then reach your population? So I, I see a big connectivity tissue here for that first area of focus. To your point, Nigel, but we then somehow you layer back in the new requirements with climate and sustainability and capabilities and things like that. But this lack of being able to engage, I see this is a great suggestion on a stronger connectivity with groups such as this. I, I think that's an excellent point. And that goes directly to address the concerns that were raised by our speaker from GSA that said, we need help finding these firms. Well, then the question is, how do you guys, how can you guys leverage your networks to help us find these firms? It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. And, and when we and we talk about industry partnerships, right? I mean, that's the title of our group. So when we're talking about people, these are people who have diverse companies that should be industry partners. I mean, yeah. they should be partners throughout the government. And they probably are with individuals inside the government because we heard that from one of our speakers but there's no continuity of connectivity that, to advance the utilization of these groups. Yeah, they kind of get buried in industry side, right? Of it versus like if it was industry slash comma association partnerships, right? It, just to bring it to the forefront to say, we can't forget about, about these groups. Now, is do we have any contacts here or do we want to hear from some of, I'd love to hear, I, I don't want to speak for the subcommittee, but I would love to hear like from a couple of these on what is their perspective on how, how well the government engages with them. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I, I completely agree. And I liked what Farad said about the network, right? Like, so how do they, they grow their own networks and how can, we plug in or the federal agency actually plug into the networks. And, and I was wondering like how you structure it, right? Like since our engagement with them is not necessarily related directly to integrating climate and sustainability, it's more about the partnership network and making those connections. Could you, maybe this is a question for GSA staff, could you have a few of them, right? Where you say, well, maybe you could do, you could do a bucket of three and you can have you kind of pose those questions about how they currently engage with in this in the process overall and where there's opportunities to improve and then how they maintain their networks and grow their networks and then is there connectivity that could be gained you know through training and additional resources that are available through GSA and so cuz i'm just wondering if you if we just did one off one i think it would take a while to get through a bunch um, and so i'm wondering if there's a way to consolidate a few to be able to get their feedback sooner than later. Yeah, and there, and there was a couple of, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I, just a couple and Maria, I'll bring you in just a second. Uh, in your research approach, you can, you know, with your subcommittee, you can divide and conquer and build a, just a, a, a sample question. You can build a, a script and the questions you wanna ask and that way you can cover more ground because you have limited time as to how many you know, how many meetings you have. So that's your research approach. You can totally do that. Um, you know, with the uh, the 13 members you have, you can divide and conquer. And then like in groups of two, you can meet with specific individuals to represent, then you can report out to the subcommittee. So that's that's one approach. Um, but I did want to bring Maria in. Looks like Maria had it, some insight here in, in your comment, uh, Kimberly. Uh, yeah, I was just responding to Kristen's question about whether we should invite some of these groups in. And um, I, uh, I actually have a contact that I met a couple of weeks ago. I think she works for the, it's, and I cannot remember if it was a minority business 
and, and I'm like Farad, I get all these acronyms mixed up even though I'm in DC, but it's either one of the minor business development agency or uh, one of the chambers of commerce that have a, a national headquarters in DC and then it has local state you know, all over the country. And this person runs the one in um, Louisiana. And she offered to, which I thought was a good idea, peer, um, should be willing to come to speak with you and speak to you from like the local state level and then have the D DC national director counterpart of whatever group I'm talking about. And I'll have to just go back to my email. They'd be willing to come and, um, and, and present to the community if that would be helpful because I'd give you the national perspective and the local perspective. Yeah, so I think that would be great. I was saying in terms of the, you know. Yeah, I don't know what that. I think I think I think we're on to something here. So I think yes, if you could forward that information and we could we could reach out and then I think maybe if we could reach out to a few of these and get a few of them together just to talk about perspectives if we get good questions. Boris to your I think that's great. To your interview actually based on the conversation we had at one of the other meetings. Uh, that was one of the topics I wanted to bring up today, so I'm glad you mentioned it. And I started to make a form because I think it would be nice if we kind of had a standard right. approach. And of course, I can't share my screen, and I believe it's in the main subdirectory, but I can send the link out after. It's called IPS Subcommittee Interview Form. Um, I kind of uh, borrowed from Stephanie's template for email reaching out to public speakers. So there is a standard template to reach out to public speakers. Um, and then and then um, so this would be, you know, it would we would have the links into who we are and what our focus is, what our mission is. Um, and then we could curate a loose set of somewhat standardized questions so that if, as we were out talking to different groups, we could be gathering information. You, you could just talk to them, take notes, bring it back to the subcommittee for subcommittee work. Um, and this could be part of our discovery process. So, and um, so I, I wanted to get some discussion around that. I know for me, I always like to have a tool in hand when I'm going to speak to somebody and uh, it would be nice if we could get um, some broader perspectives and not have to bring them into a meeting just talk to them uh, many of you in your normal uh course of business will be interacting with firms that might have some input here uh we could just gather those up and, and make that part of our subcommittee work so uh we could have some discussion um around that now sorry boris i'm putting you on the spot here but uh the form i'll send the link out to the form after the key is going to be we should have a set of one, three to five standard questions, and then maybe some specific questions around the particular group you're interviewing with. But is this something subcommittee members are open to and would want to participate in within your own networking circles? Did I lose everybody? No, I think we're all saying yes in our different way. I'm shaking my head. I see for all. Oh, I'm sorry. We're all kind of we're all doing this. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 challenging to see the different screens when you're uh, you got the presentation up. So yeah, I think it would be good. So we'll work that between now um, and I'll send out the link. We if we could have some iterations on just formalizing the document and a couple of key questions. Can have a couple blank questions depending on where the conversation goes and then the commitment would be for people to bring that back so we could discuss that during our administrative meetings compile that and and put that out so i think that would be wonderful okay and then i don't think we have any other speakers listed um so is there any other speakers uh from anyone on the call that maybe you thought of that you want us to start to think about and pursue I think a couple of us have said we're in existing ongoing conversations with people that we're kind of vetting. And so please look to us to submit things maybe next week or the week after 
to the share site of potential speakers. But it'd be helpful if we just circulate it again, maybe just an email to the membership, just the format that you want us to put our recommendation in. So it's all consistent. Because I know yeah. there was a structure like the name of the organization, why you think they would be a good speaker, a little bit of their bio and things like that. If you could share that again, that would be helpful. Okay, absolutely. Will do. Excellent. Okay, I think that, uh, how are we doing on time? We're at 344, which is great. Um, if Boris, are you able to open the copy of GAPVAC IPS February 1st? I put it in the public folder. Right there, the PowerPoint, copy of GAPVAC IPS February 1st. It's right there and right on the bottom. Great. So just want to remind folks where we are. So today's February 1st, and we still have a lot of runway, so it looks, but just a reminder that um, we're going to be doing some input, you know, over the next several weeks with these uh, speakers, some more discovery and refinement, but then we will, we should be switching gears into getting back into those two areas of priorities, recommendations, and, and starting to really uh, build those out. So just as a reminder of, of where we are. We do have our administrative meeting next week and then our next public meeting on the 15th. Um, very good. So with that, um, I think, um, let me just ask Stephanie and Boris for a process check. Would it be wise to open it up for some public input at this point? Yeah, I think it'll be a good idea, Kristen. And then if, if we don't have um, any comments or suggestions, uh, I would say go back to your discussion. Okay, very good. So at this time, if we have any um, comments or suggestions, we welcome them. Um, I see Josh, you're here again, and I saw that you put something in the chat. Would you like to read what you put in the chat? Uh, thank you, Stephanie. No, it, that can that can live back in that part of the conversation. I do have a different comment if that's welcome. Please, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Josh Jacobs with WAP Sustainability. Um, you were asking in terms of, you know, who should present. Uh, Nigel brought up a very good point earlier. Um, there, there are a lot of things that, that GSA and EPA are starting to get involved in. To be fair, they, they don't have the staff that has dealt with it. Things like product category rules and life cycle assessments and environmental product declarations that are now being used that um, organizations outside are, are starting to, to do. Um, small, large, women-owned, uh, minority-owned, uh, veteran businesses. Um, so you may want to have someone come in uh, that is a life cycle assessment expert that is working with these organizations to explain what some of these things mean to you and how they're used. Um, I, I'll throw our hat in the ring. We are the largest LCA provider in North America at the moment and work with all levels of organizations from Fortune five companies to, again, minority-owned business, women-owned business, small business uh, certified organizations. And we have present, I've presented on five continents on sustainable procurement. So more than willing to, to help you folks understand some of these acronyms and, and how these things are getting used, maybe some of the pitfalls and things of that nature, um, just so the sustainability side is, is, is understood. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Do you mind if I ask Josh a question? Because I, I want to go back to his point because I think it was directly relevant to the growth of the ecosystem. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, you're, you're talking about the, the there are companies out here that are doing things that subject matter expert would be considered sustainable, but they don't know it. If you could tie that to how we grow the, the footprint and, and leverage existing technical assistance tools or programs or whatever, then how how could we identify those companies, reach out to those companies and give them the knowledge necessary to educate them that they are doing something sustainable and that this is an opportunity for them to be a part of a new economy. Yeah, Nigel, I, really quickly, if you don't mind, um, I, I think it's huge. I think there are many businesses on the smaller side that don't understand that the federal government has you know, requirements around recycled content in certain things. Uh, that don't fully understand that there's an opportunity for them and their products 
may fall into some of these categories, whether they be quote unquote environmentally friendly. Um, so it's 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 an education. I mean, I'm as I mentioned, I mean, we're dealing with massive corporations who have mountains and mountains of uh, government affairs people and lawyers. And I bring up to them that GSA has proposed, um, you know, governmental suppliers between seven million and fifty million dollars are going to start requiring scope one and two emissions, and that's out for common, and they're shocked. So I mean asking smaller businesses to fully understand what's available to them as sustainable is is shocking even to the largest companies in the world. So um, I think trying to explain to them some of the executive orders that have come out in the past that are still irrelevant, um, some of the, uh, the FAR regulations that are around sustainability, simple things like that. Um, you know, I understand the FAR to a uh, to a certain degree, certainly not to the levels that some folks on this call certainly have. Um, and it's it's still scary to me to go in there and understand the individual. So we need to put it in plain language. Like if you're selling paper to the government and you're a small business, what's your recycled content? That can be valuable for the government to understand. And oh, by the way, helps cut carbon, right? So it, it helps in multiple levels. So Nigel, I don't know, that's a lot of words to answer your question, but I think we need to, need to put it in simple terms for them, um, which isn't always easy for governmental agencies to do because of all the hoops they have to jump through. No, thank you. That's great. And, you know, oh, David, go ahead, please. No, thank you. Uh, this is a great conversation. It, it kind of called to mind, and I think we've talked around it before, you know, the idea of a benchmark. I don't know if you ever looked at your water bill, at least from your my water utility, WSCC, it says, this is what the average household uses per person. This is what you use. And then you can make an assertion, you can ascertain, am I doing better than average or am I really a water, I use too much water, waste too much water, how can I improve? I don't know, Josh, you gave the example of the business that didn't know how good it was because it didn't have a reference point to measure itself. Um, and I don't know how we get that information. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of companies are now, or at least utilities that you know provide you know, water, you know natural gas, electricity. They often say your neighborhood average is this. This is what you are, kind of to give a sense of sort of how you know well you're doing, so to speak. I, I don't know if that's possible, but certainly uh, having a point of reference would be really useful for probably most of the companies looking to be suppliers. Thanks, David. I think that's great. It, it makes me think back to this whole concept of a maturity model where, you know, basic knowledge is part of a maturity model. Like if you already have basic knowledge, you know, move on to step two. But if you don't, this is where you go. And these are all the right terms. And these are the resources you can reach out to. But if you're if you're if you're already, you know, on step five, then this is where we want you to focus. And so I it think is, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Um, what I'm hearing consistently across the subcommittees, though, is that there's a lot of assumptions being made about what people know and what businesses know that um, really have to be validated. And some of this discovery is validating that that probably knowledge level is much lower and much less dispersed um, than we may think. All right, Kristen, we have another um, hand raised. Um, look like it's possibly someone from the public. Um, Steve, would you like to speak? All right, yeah, thank you. This is Steve Coy from BIFMA. We uh, represent the furniture industry. And just wanted to let you know, I mean, kind of going off of what uh, Josh was saying too, uh, happy to be involved. I'm actually working with the government of Canada to David's point on this kind of baseline concept uh, and, and what we're doing there. They want essentially the same idea of how to look at carbon footprint of furniture and uh, what what is good versus maybe what's not so good. So happy to be involved if I can help in that way. Um, it is a very tricky conversation and I completely agree with where Josh was going with it. There's a lot of good things going on. People just aren't even aware sometimes of what they need to do and or what they're doing well. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. So some common themes coming out, which even though we may not like where they're going, I like that we're hearing common themes start to kind of come out through our discovery. I think at this point, I see Holly is on and do we have, and Stephen is on, Stephen is on, great. 
So, hey, Kristen. Um, yeah. Uh, just one point for our public uh, participant. I really appreciate your input. I put in the chat an email, an email address that you can send your suggestions and comments. Just want to make sure we capture you all have some really good things to say. So you stay at gappack at gsa.gov and we'll be sure to be getting your input as well and make sure that the, the subcommittee gets your, your suggestions. But I just want to say, so you uh, got pack at gsa.gov and then we'll be able to get your, your input. Great, thank thanks Boris. And thank, thanks again for the public for, for listening and engaging. I think that's invaluable. I think we all uh, really value your feedback. Stephanie, and Kristen, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention it, and this is not to call anyone on the carpet or to make any comments or suggestions, that we also have Miss Lewis, who is also listening in today. Um, and she's uh, been very um, engaged in our conversation. So I just want to put that out there and thank her uh, for attending today. Thank you. And I concur with what everybody is saying, because I think technical assistance and wraparound services are going to be key in this and bringing that understanding. Um, we have to be able to connect the dots and speak the language and not leave those who have normally been left out out of the conversation. So I appreciate everything that everyone's saying that's spot on. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so I think we're ready to move on to our uh, guest speakers, um, Holly and Stephen from EPA. And Holly, before you got on, we were talking about acronyms and lots of names, and there's a lot of P's in your title. Uh, I was thinking about <laughs> as I read it. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we're very happy to have you back. And as I mentioned to the group, um, the, Holly and Stephen spoke to the Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee. So we asked them to come and join our sub subcommittee. So without further ado, I think we'll jump right into it if you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for including us today in this really important conversation. And uh, my colleague, Stephen Sullivan, and I were really looking forward to, to discussing this with you and really want to thank you all for your dedication and commitment to helping to advance federal sustainable procurement. We appreciate the help and the input. Absolutely. Um, so we are going, I'm going to go to the next slide. And um, we're going to give you a real quick overview of our environmentally preferable purchasing program. Don't try to say that too fast. You might hurt yourself. Um, and then very briefly talk about the purchaser role in ensuring federal sustainable procurement, which the other subcommittee asked us to cover and found helpful. Then we're going to outline two key challenges to successful federal sustainable procurement. It's not to say that those are the only two. There are many, many challenges. Um, I've been at this since, uh, wow, I shouldn't even say, I think 2005 or so. Um, and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for improvement where we're focused on just two today. And we're going to provide information on two different opportunities to address those challenges. One that's in process right now, and one that's ready and ripe for further exploration that we'll hope this, the committee will consider in more depth. So if we go to the next slide, um, the federal government is the biggest purchaser in the world in many cases. Uh, and as a result, harnessing the power of our pocketbook can really be a significant driver towards building a more sustainable marketplace for not just the federal government, but all purchasers worldwide. So our program was stood up in 1993 by President Clinton to help federal purchasers to procure more sustainable products and services as a way to get to that goal of creating a more sustainable marketplace. And we've been a quiet little group for a while and we are um, not so uh, hidden anymore. Uh, there's a lot of interest in using federal procurement to meet sustainability objectives these days, as I'm sure you've noticed in the news. Um, next slide, please. So our program takes a life cycle multi-attribute approach to defining environmentally preferable. And what that means is we look at the environmental and public health impacts that happen during the manufacturing, the use and the disposal of a product or service that feds procure. And we help to uh, engage in the development or the update of private sector products and product and service sustainability standards and eco labels. Uh, to help us 
as purchasers have a way to identify and procure more sustainable versions of those products and services. We also assess and recommend standards and eco labels in the market for use by federal purchasers. And we assist feds in buying products and services that meet those recommended standards and eco labels. And we assist small businesses in selling their greener products to and services to the federal government. And then we also help to calculate the environmental benefits of federal sustainable procurement. So I'm not gonna be talking about our recommendations of standards and eco labels today, but for folks who would like to take a closer look, you can go to epa.gov slash greener products and you can see what we have there. We're in the process of expanding those recommended standards and eco labels, um, and we'll be doing starting that expansion and assessment process this year. Uh, we just had a request for um, proposals, or essentially uh, asked standards and eco labels to let us know if they would like to be considered for assessment by EPA. And we're just compiling that information and building our priority prioritization plan right now. So um, next slide, please. This is, um, of course, purchasers have a central role in ensuring that we meet our federal sustainable purchasing requirements. Once they've determined what they wanna buy, then of course they need to determine how they're gonna buy it. And there are a lot of different options available in the federal space on how we buy things. Depending on what's being purchased, agencies may choose to use a purchase card or a contract. They may use an existing contract or they may create a new one. The contracts that they use may be one built and used by their office or their whole agency, or it may be managed by another agency like a government-wide acquisition contract or a GWAC or by GSA. The contracts that they, uh, these, these contracts could be considered to be best in class, meaning that they help agencies to procure one or more of the top 10 goods and services purchased by the U.S. government and they've been reviewed and determined to be in alignment um, with key USG indicators of excellence. And these procurement methods here on the slide are just a few examples of the kinds of ways that we purchase in the federal government. Um, some of you may be able to do a, a better layout of all the details here than what we have on the slide, but this was just meant to give you a broad sense of the scape and the, the, the landscape of federal procurement. And I think it's important to note that these boxes are not exclusive to each other. Um, there are some government-wide acquisition contracts, for example, that are best-in-class contracts, and purchase cards can be used to procure off some of the GSA schedule contracts. And for all the paths that we choose that are on this slide and not on this slide, um, the purchaser can ensure that we're procuring more sustainable products and services by conducting market research to determine which federal sustainable procurement requirements apply to the particular product and service they're trying to buy. They can determine if those requirements are already included in the contract or um, any mechanism. They can require in RFPs and or task orders under existing contracts provision of compliant products, and they can seek compliant products in online catalogs. They can provide data on sustainable procurements made via the federal procurement data system. And ideally, they can ask the vendors to provide them with data that helps inform their tracking of their sustainable procurements. Um, so let's go to the next slide. What's the problem that we're gonna focus on in this conversation? Um, there are key major existing contracts today that don't include the relevant applicable federal sustainable procurement requirements. And we know that there are many RFPs issued every day from the federal government that also don't include the relevant federal sustainable purchasing requirements. So what can we do to try to address that? Next slide, please. We have launched last year something called the Sustainability Check Initiative. And this is part of the federal category management program, looking at those 10 most commonly purchased goods and services across the federal government and coordinated under the category management leadership council. It's a joint effort that's overseen by OMB and CEQ and it's led by EPA in close collaboration with GSA. And the goal of this 
uh, program is to ensure that the master contract documents of the largest federal contracts include the text that requires vendors to meet all relevant federal sustainability requirements. And we also want to not just stop there, but we're also encouraging through this process that all the managers of these major contracts think creatively about sustainability and go beyond our requirements when feasible and explore innovative opportunities to advance sustainability. Next slide, please. We have a lot of new directives that have been given to the federal government to really up the ante and increase focus on our federal sustainable procurement efforts. And these are just a few of the executive orders where we see some of that new directive, uh, those new directives coming to us. Um, and those include minimizing the risk of climate through procurement, which I think you were talking about uh, when right before we got on, um, purchasing sustainable products and services, not just what's statutorily required, but to the maximum extent practicable, purchasing products and services that are identified and recommended by EPA to achieve our net zero emissions procurement goal and also a, a whole host of other sustainability objectives and to use sustainable vehicles, delivery and shipping. So um, slide 10, please, the next one. Um, the sustainability check initiative has three phases to it. We're in phase one right now. We're reviewing 20 of the 37 best-in-class contracts right now for alignment with federal sustainable purchasing requirements. Uh, we conducted that assessment and we have uh, provided our initial review results back to the big solution managers. And we're now working in collaboration with them to ensure accuracy of the review results and creating plans for how they might increase alignment. In phase two, we'll be shifting to review some of the tier two and tier one contracts. Um, and throughout this whole process, again, we're going to, just, going to be encouraging innovation and thinking about going beyond uh, compliance. Next slide, please. This gives you a little bit more of a visual of the breakdown. So we have 650 billion in products and services that we purchased most recently in the federal government in the last fiscal year. Um, of those, about 400 billion are spent on commonly purchased goods and services. In phase one, we're focusing on this blue part of the pie chart, which is the best in class contracts. And we'll be looking at 20 of the 37 of those. And we focused on those because they really are considered to be best in class. And we're hoping by getting those more in alignment with our federal sustainable purchasing requirements, we can then be able to influence the rest of the pie. And in phase two, we will be looking at the multi-agency contracts and these mandatory agency-wide contracts and strategically doing reviews because there's quite a few more contracts in those two buckets, as you can see. Um, and we'll need to be thinking about how we can uh, target uh, the most important ones for um, meeting these goals. Next slide, please. So our current sustainability check initiative focus, as I said, in phase one is in the six prioritized best in class category management categories. And that includes IT, facilities and construction, industrial products and services, office management and professional services. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Stephen, to uh, provide a little more detail about the initiative and where we're at. Stephen. Thank you, Holly. Can can people hear me? I hope so. Holly? Yep, I hear you. Hello? Fine. Oh, yep, you do? Great, great, great. You. Okay, yep. great, great, great. Okay. So um, so phase one. Uh here's just a little uh a little uh update on our progress for phase one. Um, we had a, you know, it, it may sound so simple. You just look at a contract document, see if it has sustainability requirements, and you're done. Well, it's a little, a little more involved than that. Here are some of the major steps. I won't go through all of them, but um, number one is, you know, uh, building the right team to conduct the review, coming up with a spreadsheet tool to review the contracts against all the right sustainability requirements clauses, sustainability requirements, and of course, uh, making sure we're, we have a clarity and alignment on what the, which clauses to include and not include. There's quite a number uh, of clauses, sustainability requirement clauses in the federal acquisition requirements, and we want to be sure that we're referencing uh, the appropriate ones and also the ones that matter for 
the uh, particular contracts involved. Uh, so IT contracts may have a different set of applicable requirements than, say, one focused on office supplies or um, demolitions of, of buildings, that sort of thing. Uh, so we developed this tool, we uh, did a review, we also offered model contract text uh, so that when we find a missing, uh, some missing sustainability requirements, uh, sustainability clause, we can just uh, let the owners of these best in class contract vehicles know all you have to do is take this language, do a copy paste, uh, and so forth. Uh, and um, anyway, we finished a preliminary review of all the high priority best in class contracts. Uh, based on these sustainability requirements, and then started sharing those out with the owners of these contracts and the category managers. Um, and uh, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, in some cases, they said, "Oh, you missed, you missed some of our master contract documents." It's uh, there's something called um, multiple award schedules, where there's sort of a blanket master contract document that applies to a whole bunch of contract best in class contract vehicles. In many cases, we missed that one. People didn't share that one with us, that document. So we did a new review of that one and, and were able to check more boxes um, and so forth. And um, so anyway, so we're, uh, plan we plan in the future to deliver uh, kind of report cards on how well these contracts are doing against these sustainability requirements. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in our review of these con these master contract documents, uh, we uh, rate these uh, these master contract documents, these best in class contract vehicles, uh, in the following way. Um, in the perfect scenario, the ideal scenario, every single appropriate applicable sustainability clause is already in the master contract. Uh, from our review, we call it sustainability check, and when that happens. Um, uh, the plan is for the acquisition gateway website to include a little icon, like almost like an eco label on that master, uh, on that uh, best in class, on that bit, best in class contract vehicle. Uh, the next best thing is, well, um, we found one or more missing uh, sustainability clauses. Uh, the owner of the contract recognizes those those clauses that are missing and sends an email to us and to two White House offices, uh, CEQ, White, uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality and OMB, saying, we understand, that, you know, uh, there's some missing uh, clauses. We plan to update this master contract document on such and such a date and include these missing, missing, uh, missing clauses. We call that commitment made. Um, and then there's the next level of rating, uh, not yet compliant, additional action needed, meaning we found some holes, we found some gaps, but no action, no commitment has been taken yet. And then pending review, we don't, for example, we don't yet have the, the right contract document to review yet. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, a little um, example of a kind of a report card, a high level report card that we plan to submit to the Category Management Leadership Council. Um, this is just a, a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a mock-up, if you will. We don't have the actual. We're still trying to get the actual numbers where you see TBD, uh, but you can see here that uh, we have the priority categories: IT, facilities and construction, industrial products, and so forth. Uh, the amount of spend that represents annual spend, um, and uh, the number of BICs within that category that uh, who, that have made the uh, commitment to. Uh, sustainability check, the number that are uh, in full compliance and so forth. And so this is kind of a report card that uh, we plan to issue. Uh, it's in progress. Next slide. And this is a more detailed version. So this breaks it down by not just category, but by specific BIC. Uh, so the specific BIC. So you see the names of these, uh, Army Chess run by the Army, uh, NASA soup, we call it soup. Uh, I forgot what the SEWP stands for, but it's another IT one run by NASA, so forth and so on. And um, and then the BIC review rating, uh, which would be their sustainability check, commitment made, action needed, or, uh, you know, et cetera. So uh, next slide. This is the continuation of that same detailed scorecard a report card uh, showing other categories. Next slide, please. And that's, I think that's it for me. I think it's back to you, Holly. Great. 
Yeah, so now uh, we'd like to share a second opportunity with you to advance sustainable procurement. And this opportunity has not yet been implemented and is ripe for further exploration and is uh, being, we, we identified it back in 2015 when EPA managed an effort to conduct extensive research on this topic and worked in collaboration with several agencies and with uh, contract writing system uh, providers to determine what was possible. And, and the key question that we were trying to explore was how can we use automation to ensure inclusion of all the relevant sustainable procurement clauses into RFPs that are issued by the US government? So the problem that we found was that there's several required sustainable procurement clauses, and those vary in terms of which products and services they apply to. And selection of the applicable clauses is currently a manual process that's left up to RFP writers to determine. And that's very time consuming and they've got a lot of other work on their plate. Um, so this is something that, that of course re can result then in where we are today, which is very low compliance rates with incorporation of the right sustainable procurement requirements into our RFPs. And <clears throat> contract writing systems right now, in most cases are not helping to solve this problem and haven't been uh, revised to get to this issue. So, um, we, we believe that uh, right now procurement staff are really in a hard situation. Uh, procurement staff are shrinking and requirements and the volume of work is increasing. Green procurement is really not gonna happen unless we make this easier for federal procurement staff and for requesters. And um, the, find, the research that we did at EPA found that contract writing systems are used by all federal agencies today. 80% of federal agencies use a particular contract writing system called PRISM, at least as of 2015, <laughs> as their base contract writing system. And the selection of appropriate FAR clauses via these systems is currently, as I mentioned, left to the RFP writers um, and very time consuming. So next slide, please. Um, I have about four or five slides here that just list what the actual sustainable procurement requirement clauses are, um, just for your reference. I'm not gonna go through every one of these today, but you'll just get a sense of you know, what the clauses are that are, uh, and all of these apply to different product and service care uh, categories. Um, so here's another, and then there are new ones that have come out uh, under this administration as well. Um, and um, so you can see some of those. So I'll go to slide uh, 24 now, which is the one with the bar chart, yeah. So the Federal Energy Management Program has annually reviewed RFPs that are put up on SAM.gov and um, looked at the ones that involve procurement of energy using products that are relevant and uh, that FEMP and Energy Star apply to. And they have consistently found that we're not hitting our 100% goal of compliance. And that it, as of the last time they checked, last fiscal year, only 67% of the RFPs issued had the Energy Star clause that was uh, relevant and applicable to that procurement included. And only 70% of them had the FEMP requirement included the federal energy management program requirement for low standby power. So this definitely impacts our ability to hit our net zero emissions procurement goals. Next slide, please. Holly, it might be worth pointing out that those are just two of many, many sustainability clauses and requirements, and probably two of the more uh, longstanding ones that um, we don't even have compliance on those. Yeah, very good point, Stephen. As I mentioned with those other uh, five slides beforehand, there's a lot of other clauses and we're not evaluating those at this point, um, but I think we can extrapolate from this data on Energy Star and FEMP that we don't have the compliance where we need it to be and incorporation of these clauses where they need to be. So next slide, please, yeah. Um, we believe that by making this easier and automating the appropriate um, selection of clauses on sustainable procurement and via the contract writing systems, we're going to really help save time and effort for our purchasers. 
um, and our requesters. We're also going to increase compliance and we'll simplify and integrate it into standard practice. Next slide. So the opportunity that we see is to prioritize the most frequently used contract writing systems in the federal government today and then update them to automate addition of these clauses into our RFPs. And slide uh, next slide shows we think it probably makes the most sense. We'll need to double check um, to determine which contract writing systems are still most commonly used, but we believe it still is PRISM due to the cost associated with shifting to new contract writing systems, um, that we should focus on PRISM and that we should work with DOE who manages the PRISM Federal Users Group uh, to further explore this opportunity and um, to uh, basically take the API that GSA developed in response to EPA's research. And an API is something that you can plug into a system and it allows to, the inclusion of an automation of incorporation of clauses. Um, we could update that API and we could then incorporate it into PRISM and to be able to begin to automate selection of clauses. Next slide, please. So what we need uh, is to designate and fund a federal agency to focus on this opportunity and to direct that PRISM federal users group to explore the opportunity further in collaboration. And if ripe, to tell CompuSearch, the owner of PRISM, to activate this capability, and possibly pilot integration of the API into uh, one agency's federal contract writing system and then share the lessons learned from that pilot across the government and possibly begin to require and encourage RFP writers to use contract writing systems from start to finish. Because right now, what well, I should say as of 2015, um, contract writers were cutting and pasting RFPs into contract writing systems, which then removes the opportunity for that system to provide that automation that we would like to see happen. And lastly, we think it'll be really important for any initiative in this space to coordinate with planned updates to the FAR requirements that are being developed under FAR case 2022-006. So that is it for what we were gonna present to you today, but we also do have some responses to the questions that you had posed via email, um, I think for us and Happy to do Q and A now, and then get to that. And that uh, our responses to those questions, or we can do that. Uh, provide our responses to those questions now, and then have Q and A. Whatever you would prefer. Yeah, and, and I'll I'll turn it over to you, Kristen, to sort of kind of moderate the the conversation. Uh, yeah. But that, but I do have one quick question, uh, Holly. Before we go in there. Um, who in GSA is, uh, has developed the API? Is this out of the Federal Acquisition Service Group? Yep, or? yep. it's uh, Brennan Conaway okay. and, and the team that he's part of. Yep. Okay, great. They, yeah, they were very part. good collaboration. They're always great collaborators with us. We work very closely with them. Okay, great. And we're we're looped in with Brennan and and his team. So perfect. Okay, okay. so back to you, Kristen. So I'll let you just kind of moderate this. The rest. Sure. Of this. Sure. Um, great. And I, I would love if we could get right into some of the questions we sent you. I think it'll help get some of the creative juices going. Okay, great. So I think your first one was, uh, what's currently going on to engage with industry on climate and sustainability and how are changes and efforts being received? Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot going on across the government to more directly work with our supply chain to reduce our climate impacts um, and meet our net zero emission procurement goal by 2050. Um, and just generally increase sustainability. So I'm one person in the federal government. I'm probably not going to cover everything for you, um, but um, we did talk about it in our team. And I think there's one uh, thing that I, action we're taking that I think is probably the most prominent, and that is the draft FAR case 2021-015, which I'm sure you guys have been talking about. It sounded like you might have been before we got on the call. Um, and that is focused on um, historic action that we're taking to address greenhouse gas emissions and protect the federal government supply chains from climate related mm. financial risk. And have you already had a presentation on that? Or is it helpful to give like a quick run through of what's included in that case? 
So, so I can I can talk to that a little bit. We uh, because it is an ongoing far case, and so we're in the rulemaking process. So within GSA, since GSA is managed, it's a manager, one of the partners in the far council. Yeah. Um, so we have some limitations on how much GSA can actually speak to us since they're actually yeah. writing the rule. But I think it would be helpful for the team to hear a little bit of your perspective on that. So, but we had definitely talked about it. I think that that would be helpful for this group. Okay. Um, and it is out for public comment right Correct. now, the draft case, and um, the deadline to provide comment is February 13th. Um, so the case and what I'm sharing is in from the public fact sheet that has been issued. Um, if it's finalized as proposed, it would require major federal suppliers to publicly disclose their GHG emissions and climate-related financial risks and to set science-based emission reduction targets. And uh, it covers approximately 85% of the GHG emissions associated with the federal supply chain, which is more than twice as large as emissions from our federal buildings and our vehicles combined. So um, a lot of our GHG emission impact in the federal government is happening through our procurements, through our supply chain. And we need to, the, the intent of this case is to take that to task and to try to try to work to reduce that. Um, and the rule takes a, you, the unique needs of our small business suppliers into account, which I think is of interest to this group, it sounds like. Um, under the proposed rule, the largest suppliers who receive more than $50 million in annual contracts would be required to publicly disclose scope one, two, and relevant categories of scope three emissions and disclose climate-related financial risks and to set science-based emission reduction targets. And then contractors with more than 7.5 million, but less than 50 million in annual contracts would be required to report just their scope one and scope two emissions. And then uh, all uh, of the federal contracts, contractors with less than 7.5 million in annual contracts would be exempt from this rule. And all small businesses, who might have over 7.5 million in annual contracts would only be required to report scope one and two emissions under the proposed rule. So um, this, this rule really builds on the innovation that's already taking place in industry to tackle climate change. And we know that today more than half of our major federal contractors are already disclosing climate related information. Um, and that we know also that there's 1,800 small and medium uh, sized inter enterprises that are already disclosing emissions and climate risk through the carbon disclosure project. I'm sorry. Um, so that was kind of our um, thought on that question. And we have we have answers to the other questions that you posed as well. But any thoughts or um, things we should talk about there? Holly, well, I'm sorry. That last comment you made was through uh, the 1,800 that are... Um, Disclosing through, you mentioned a program. I didn't quite catch that. The Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, which is the mechanism that's talked about within the FAR case is one of the tools we'll use from the okay. private sector. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the questions we have is thinking about, um, so it's interesting to learn about the fact that we don't have full compliance on even getting it in the contracts and the RFIs that go out. So as you, as we start to, as the government starts to turn the lever on that and ramp that up, you know, one of the things our team is really focused on is, are there any unintended consequences on the small business community, uh, the target area that we're focusing on relative to small, women-owned, minority-owned, underserved? Um, so, and I think we talked about it in the AWS subcommittee is, you know, there's a, is it a perception or a reality that these requirements will limit the supplier pool, particularly to this subset of suppliers? Yeah. And if we could have some thoughts around and discussion around that. Holly, you want me to try that? I can sure. Yeah. So um, this question comes up every few years in the sustainable purchasing, sustainable products space. I imagine it happens in other sustainability realms. Uh, a bunch of years ago, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I think it was, uh, this question came up and um, I took it upon myself to do a little research. And so I put the, the question out to the leading eco-labels and sustainability standards um, developers uh, out there. 
Um, on my list was uh, Green Seal. I'm trying to think from memory here. Green Seal, uh, BIFMA, the, the level of the furniture standard. I think NSF International possibly. I looked at Energy Star. I looked at, um, uh, what else did I look at? I looked at a whole bunch of eco labels and standards and, and quite a few got back to me and said, yes, we did run the data. And, uh, oh, and I gave them the definition of small business from the SBA, Small Business Administration. And the, uh, they gave me data back. I put it all into uh, some nice charts. And it came back uh, as a surprise to a lot of people because uh, a very large percentage of those companies that were offering the qualified certified products were uh, defined as small or medium-sized businesses as SBA's definition go. Um, uh, not to say that some small businesses don't struggle to meet these requirements. I imagine it's a struggle for some, uh, but um, it's it certainly shows that, uh, you know, quite a few small businesses were qualifying. In fact, it was um, skewed maybe a little bit towards small and medium-sized businesses. Um, and just from my own personal experience, I, I worked at AT&T many years ago when it was the biggest company in the world. And they just took forever to get new innovations out the door. And in a way, this sustainability space is an innovation space. And um, there's lots of research showing that innovation often does not go to the incumbents. It goes to the new companies. I mean, I mean, Tesla is the classic example of recent mind, but there's lots of research about this, about why do the incumbents not, do, they can't move as quickly sometimes in innovation. And um so I, I think it's 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 not it's a bit of a myth to say this is a large company's game. Mm -hmm. Also, within our program, when we assess and recommend standards and eco labels for use in federal purchasing, we have a framework that we use, which is a set of evaluation criteria. When we look at standards and eco labels that um, are both sort of the gold standard kind of criteria that we'd like to see standards and eco labels. Uh, utilize in order to make sure that they're most effective and uh, most best practice in the market. And one of the criteria we have in there is the encouraging all eco labels to develop sliding scales for the costs to get products certified and to make sure that uh, we encourage and make that door as open as possible to the small business community. Um, so that they really do get the opportunity to engage um, with uh, all of the sustainability initiatives going on. I think you're muted. Uh... And you, Chris, you did send us another question that we have an answer to as well, uh, a couple of others. So, and I, I have that, if, you know, when you're ready. Um, great. Yeah, I was saying it was interesting on the sliding scale. We've had a lot of discussions about that relative to, you know, sometimes we've got to meet people where they are. They may be more advanced in their sustainability efforts than others. And if you're just starting out, you know, we still want to open up pathways to those companies and, and you know, keep the supply pool as wide as possible. Um, do we have any questions from the uh, subcommittee? This is Mamie. I have a question uh, and I'm gonna ask Stephanie to help me out. I had sent her the questions from the, the four dimensional aspect. I, I think this grid helps me out a little bit, except I don't think it's, so I was wondering, you, you put the four disciplines like IT uh, facility and construction, and vehicles, and it was a fourth one, and you have the contract values, uh, but I, and I guess, and that, those are the areas uh, that have the most impact for sustainability, reducing footprint and all. The question is around the contract values and we're small, um, disadvantaged businesses, small or, yeah, small, medium, small, A days and disadvantaged businesses uh, are playing in the arena. Are we tracking that? If we track that, we could 
we could we could see the cross section that we might be able to focus on and so, and identify so, are there barriers if that space is void why is that and um and the impact as these uh additional requirements are coming forward from the federal government because the waiver is fine in the beginning but there has to be some way to get them fully into the game so I, I, I might be able to take that uh, stab at that mm -hmm. question. So neither Holly or I are, are you know, uh, well, Holly's more of a procurement expert than I am, but most of our day is spent on sustainable procurement. But um, in this whole category management initiative, which I imagine this, this committee has been briefed on, uh, uh, which is a federal-wide effort on procurement, um, a primary focus is small business. In fact, we've been on, we've been invited to many calls for the category management initiative. And the two topics that just always come up are cost savings and small business. Those are the, the two, they have extensive metrics to ensure that these BICs, these best in class contract vehicles, and the whole category management enterprise is focused on those two things. There are other aspects too that, that, uh, that they look at, but those are the main two. And um, and uh, so what we're talking about here is making sure the sustainability is also um, the existing requirements that have been on the books for a long time in most cases are also included in these best in class contract vehicles. It would be very interesting to see if 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 the category management initiative could track this to see what percentage of those small vendors are offering the sustainable the the products that meet these eco labels and standards and meet the sustainability requirements um we've been begging for better data on federal procurement and sustainability but that's one question i don't think we've asked but it might be a great question if that's the you know so they could could prove uh, whether or not uh, demonstrate whether or not uh, small businesses can in fact are in fact qualifying their products for these requirements and if not maybe that could be maybe some additional assistance uh, some additional on-ramp efforts could be made to ensure that they can. I don't know if that gets at your question, but or not. Yes, that's what that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I think we'd love to see more data on sustainability in the federal level in general. It's 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 a little embarrassing how little data we have federal wide on sustainability, sustainable pro, uh, purchasing, sustainable supply chain. Uh, that's improving, but there's a, a a whole lot more we could do in that space and cross connecting that with small business seems to just make a lot of sense to me. I don't know if anyone else mm -hmm. has thoughts on it. Maybe that's the maybe recommendation around uh, the data collection mm -hmm. because you can't analyze it without the data. Yeah. You can't yeah. make an informed decision or have the implications of the barriers. Yeah, right now we have in uh, through the federal procurement data system, 8A and 8B are the two categories of uh, data we collect on our sustainable procurements and in the federal government. And the questions are really woefully out of date. And there's been a need to update uh, the that those questions for some time. And um, there's been some really innovative work that's been done by Sandia National Labs, by uh, State of Massachusetts, by State of Maryland um, to better track and report their sustainable procurements. And so um, yeah. we that was one thing we wanted to suggest to you today was to take a closer look and, and provide some, it would be very helpful to have some recommendations related to reporting and tracking and how to improve yeah. it. And there actually was a report done by uh, CEQ uh, several years ago on this specific topic. And we'd be happy to share that report with you as well. That would be useful. I, I'd like to give an extra plug to Sandia National Labs. I don't know how many folks in this call know that that is a Department of Energy laboratory. That is a federal it's a federal entity and they use an existing federal system, the SF tool that GSA has built. Uh, thanks to Michael Bloom at GSA, they've used that tool to do amazing tracking of sustainable products and purchasing by vendor and by product category. And even uh, I think they're going to roll in, get some estimates of emissions reductions and so forth. Um, I would think with a little bit of effort, they could probably 
uh, you know, identify which of those vendors are small business, medium-sized business per SBA's definition by just rolling in another data set. And I think uh, so. Yeah, and we, we did have Michael Bloom from GSA come and speak uh, to That's us. And he's, he's part of our, our network here. I think David had a hand up for a while. I, I don't yeah. know, Christine. That's okay. We... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, David. All right, thank Good you, Boris. Uh, great uh, presentation, Holly and Stephen. Uh, and great comments, Mimi. I, I want to follow up on that and something, Stephen, that you said. Um, I was going to ask, I looked at the website briefly of, with EPP, and there are limited information about, let's say, greenhouse gas emission reductions because of EP products relative to non-EP products. Mm -hmm. And at, at least from, from the comments that I heard, I think we can't say anything about how much improvement or the trend in say reduction of energy consumption or greenhouse gas emissions that best in class you know, uh, providers or products have provided over time. You know, part of I think we're struggling with is we don't know where we've been so we can't tell how much improvement we can make. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily assume that a small business is, let's say, not very efficient or not very sustainable because they may be so new that everything they do is well past you know, some average that existed 10 years ago. So um, is anything that Sandy is doing, can that be applied to sort of the work you've already done to kind of come up with some kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, best estimate of sort of how much progress we've made and maybe how much more we have left to make or what's possible. I think that would kind of help us be targeted in recommendations. That's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Well, I, first of all, I'm happy to see Isri's here. Um, we, we work with you on, on IT topics, I know, and also really happy to see Bithma's here too, another uh, key partner for our program. Um, and I'm sure there's others I don't haven't seen, so I apologize. I'm not trying to not mention you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I did want to say that IT is really the space where we have the best data in terms of uh, being able to calculate the environmental benefits from the alignment with our sustainable purchasing requirements. And we have a calculator that you can put in. I bought a thousand EP reg gold registered computers, and it will tell you here's the climate change impact reductions that my agency or my office achieved as a result of that procurement decision. And um, the Global Electronic Council also has that rolled up by aggregate federal agency procurements. And we do have that data. So um, we'd be happy to share that with you. And it might be useful to talk to GEC about their calculator. What we would very much like to see is those that kind of calculator get built for other product and service categories that have high federal spend so that we could really start to be able to measure more um, comprehensively the benefit of sustainable procurement and federal sustainable procurement actions. So that would be wonderful if your committee could encourage that kind of action to be taken to fund the development of yeah. additional calculators for other key product and service categories. And, and the moment such a calculator exists and an API is built for it, uh, Michael Bloom and his consultant, uh, Paul Shirieri, will probably build it right into this SF tool, which can then do kind of the estimates of emissions and pollution reduction that I think um, uh, that uh, you were just talking about, so. All right, thank you, appreciate that. So I had a question regarding the best in class. Um, so the best in class contract mechanisms, the big contract mechanisms, I think Holly, you mentioned it, have built in um, requirements for small business set asides, eight A's, you know, how we bring those in. But, ha and and it, I'm not, you guys are experts on this and I'm I'm not at all. So I'm just, as we start to think about scope three and if uh the the primes are bringing in small um that 
aren't required to do some of the climate uh, regu uh, requirements, but are, don't they then inherently become part of their su supply chain and then mm -hmm. part of their scope three? Yep. So has there been any risk analysis to might, and I don't know the answer, might that drive or kind of push out qualified um, small businesses that these primes might want to deal with? Because if they can't, contribute to the reduction in scope three? Like if they're a negative ad mm -hmm. on scope three, but they're a low cost yeah. provider or they're a small business, um, mm -hmm. it gets kind of complex in my head. And I just don't know <laughs> if people have mm -hmm. kind of mapped that out and have had any thoughts about that. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it's um, this was another thing I was hoping to talk about with you in response to your questions. Um, in the private sector, they've been doing some really interesting work to increase sustainability of their supply chains and address climate impacts. And they have some tools they've built that I think would be really helpful for the subcommittee to learn more about. And one of them is called Manufacture 20, uh, sorry, <clears throat> Manufacture 2030. And that's being used by the auto sector. And there's also another tool called EcoVadis that a lot of big purchasing organizations are using. What's interesting about Manufacture 2030 is the auto sector has collectively decided to use this tool. And what it is, is a place where suppliers for, for all the major auto uh, manufacturers put in their data on their sustainability status. And um, they any manufacturer can go into that system and they can see, okay, here's my top performers. And here's the ones that maybe need some more help. And why don't we work to build training and provide services and assistance to these folks that we really want to continue working with, but we'd like to ensure that they help reduce their climate impacts so that we have a reduced climate impact. Um, and so it's really been an interesting and very helpful mechanism for them to be able to work more effectively with their supply chain and see where their opportunities for improvement yeah. lie. Um, so I think the federal government should really think about whether or not a system like that could be applied for our purchases um, and um, see if we could better manage our overall conversation about sustainability with our supply chain through using yeah. that kind of a mechanism. It, there's, I'd like to add something to that if I can, if there's time. Yeah, absolutely, please. Uh, so, um, and Holly will correct me if this is out of date, but um, uh, a few years back, a big thing that I was, uh, you know, um, uh, witnessing is some very large enterprises, large companies that would do something called a sustainability spend analysis, where they would uh, feed all the spend data into a, a tool uh, based on NAICS codes or whatever, whatever. And uh, it would tell you where, so Lockheed Martin did this a few years back. I don't know if they're still doing it. And it would say out of their, I don't know, 20,000 suppliers, they were could find out where is the bulk of their greenhouse gas emissions or water consumption or fill in the blank, but on greenhouse gas emissions. And time and time again, after universities or corporations would do, retailers would do these kinds of uh, sustainability spend analyses, it seems like there was an 80-20 rule at work where like 80% of their emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, were concentrated in just a handful of spend categories. And then within those spend categories, a concentration within a handful of suppliers. So um, I'm guessing that still holds. Holly may be more up to date or someone else in this call might be more up to date. I'm guessing that still holds. So if it were to hold, then maybe what you would do is you realize, well, Okay, maybe some of these small vendors in my supply chain that are, you know, are going to be a subs to me. Um, maybe they they don't have great greenhouse gas profiles, but they represent spend categories that are really a drop in the bucket. Like it's just tiny. Let me focus on the bigger ones. Uh, maybe there's cement. There's cement somewhere in my supply okay. chain, or there's some other supplier with a, a just a huge greenhouse gas footprint that just just dwarfs those other ones. And that's really where mm -hmm. I think you'd, you'd worry. Mm -hmm. so, Holly, is that still? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a great point. And that that is what those kind of systems can help to uh, companies and big purchasers like the US government to do is to really prioritize where they wanna focus and where the biggest opportunity is. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, this is fascinating. The manufacturer 2030 is fascinating because, you know, I guess one of the things we're kind of focused on is the unintended consequence of competing priorities and escalating requirements. So small mm -hmm. business, climate, you know, there, you start to mix these things. Um, and so if you have greater than 7.5, greater than 50 million are required to do X, uh, but their, their, um, their work with bringing on small businesses negatively contributes to their scope three, you know, you get a, you get a compounding interest, but Holly, mm -hmm. what I think I heard you say is in, in the private sector, um, they've already kind of gotten beyond this. Uh, and the negative part is, you know, restricting your supply pool, you know, your OEM pool for cars, you want, you know, you need that broad, that's part of your supply chain resiliency mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. you, you only So these things all start to intertwine, but could mm -hmm. that be a model, mm -hmm. you know, that becomes part of the contracting, the procurement saying, mm -hmm. Hey, if you take, as if a large, you take on one of these type of initiatives or models and, and grow your supply, small supply pool, you know, does that help you uh, going forward? Can we can we look at that? Okay. And, and there could be a win-win. So if, let's say one yeah. major customer of yours, you're a small business, so one major customer of yours, like an auto company that's like a, up the chain, works with you and helps you become more sustainable. In theory, and maybe in practice in many cases, I'm guessing, you could then sell your products to multiple, you, you, the, the pool of potential clients grows because other clients out there might be worried about their sustainability of their supply chains or what have you. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to do it for every, you do it once and then it's, you know, you're on track in many cases, I would think. Well, it could have a compounding effect, positive compounding effect, effect versus, yeah. Yeah. you know, mitigating potentially negative effects. So, okay. Well, I think also it's important to note that a lot of times small businesses are more competitive when you're really evaluating them against sustainability factors um, they're going to beat out other uh, potential competitors in, in many instances. So it can be a positive when you're actually starting to apply sustainability criteria to your vendor community for the small mm. businesses that are competing. So okay. uh, I have one more question, but I want to I want to be mindful of time and see if the committee uh, members have any other questions. So if not, what, so one of the things we were discussing earlier is similar to your finding on, geez, our compliance with the actual contract language is actually lower. You know, we put out these requirements. We're kind of learning through talking to lots of different folks that, you know, there's this assumption that because these um, initiatives have been in place and, you know, that people know about them, that they understand them and they would understand how to comply with them. And so as we're driving these uh, compliance and contract, there, Holly, I think you mentioned it, there's so many avenues in government for engagement and outreach, but you know, how do we strengthen that connective tissue? And this is one of the areas that we're focusing on from industry partnerships. How do we engage better? What recommendations can we make to GSA to better engage, to expand mm -hmm. the supplier pool, which would mean- yeah. They know what's required and they're capable of being required. So we're we're helping yep. them get to the tools and those types of things. And just any yeah. general thoughts on that for us as a subcommittee, because that is one of our top priority areas. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the central question that we need to be asking right now, especially in relation to FAR case 2021-015. And I've been beating that drum internally um, because I think it's really important that we provide the training that's needed for all the suppliers to become aware of how they can determine what their GHG emissions are, how they can set science-based reduction targets, and just provide that, um, that information to them in a way that um, makes all of this much simpler for folks who may not have gotten to this point yet. And um, we've done a couple things already to try to address it at EPA um, in partnership, again, with our good friends in um, GSA's Federal Acquisition Services. We put out a training module on this topic 
and um, I can find it and put it in the chat so people can see that that's available publicly right now. Um, and a second thing we've done is we have uh, the Center for Corporate Climate Leadership at EPA, and they have put together a basically a calculator tool for small businesses to help them to calculate what their greenhouse gas emissions are and um, recently updated it to improve it. So, um, and that was really at the request of the White House to do that, to make it, to be ready for, um, you know, this conversation that's coming up because of the SPAR case. So um, we have been trying to really think about that need and figure out how to create the tools and the training that's needed, but we need to do more, absolutely. And I think this group could be very helpful in providing recommendations on what other things we might be able to do that haven't been done yet. Okay, great. Thank that, you. That, that sounds very reassuring because we've had a lot of conversation on this. So it's, it's really good to hear this from you, Holly. You've been doing this for a long time. So great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of common threads today. Uh, you know, a lot of things coming together, I think, for us as, as a group. So really appreciate you and Stephen joining us um, and engaging with us and Hopefully we can have you back again sometime and um, share reports on our progress. Uh, Parad, any other comments uh, for our speakers or to help close us out? No, no. I just want to say thank you so much. We continue to look at the wraparound opportunities for our, the businesses that we have that we want to support, as well as making sure that we have them um, green ready <laughs> to engage for the future so that they are not finding another obstacle that's keeping them back. Simultaneously, we like to educate all businesses um, to the importance of um, shared prosperity, understanding what the future of the market is saying. And as the government and private enterprise begins to do this, we want to carry people along as fast as we possibly can so that, um, that our entire economy can benefit and they don't have people left out. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank great. you very, very much. Uh, Thank you. Boris and Stephanie, I'm not sure if Troy or Cassius was able to join us today. Uh, Troy was in for a bit. She, she was okay. unable to stay for the whole meeting, but she was able to jump in for, for some of it. Okay, yeah. great, great. I didn't know if they had any comments. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you and Stephanie, I think. All right. Well, Boris, do you have any anything, any um, exiting comments before we uh, conclude? No, I I just want to echo uh, Holly and, and Stefan so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming back and, and really, um, like I said, I think this is really reassuring hearing your, your talk um, to both. Uh, and I feel like we definitely made, yeah, I feel good about where this subcommittee is headed. Um, also wanted to say that, so I'm working with uh, Katie to just kind of have a little, Katie Miller uh, from mm -hmm. Federal mm -hmm. Acquisition Service. So she's already she's spoken great. to the group and then we are uh, coordinating with her to have a little deeper discussion on some of the things that they're doing. So she's very interested in in collaborating, helping. Uh, she's, which is, she's, she's yeah, fantastic, we love, that's great. We love Katie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's, or, she's already been very helpful to a couple of the subcommittees. So, um, awesome. so that's really good. I would uh, say, I think that's it for me, Stephanie. I'll, I'll send it back to you. All right, well, this concludes the fifth industry partnership subcommittee meeting. The next virtual um, meeting will be held on February 15th from three to five. We again like to thank all of you and especially our guest speakers for their time um, in today's event. Um, a reminder to the public that comments and suggestions can be submitted through regulation.gov and we wish you all a great rest of your day. This meeting is now adjourned.